So really heavy topic, climate change, lots of changes, lots of challenges. And so we know this is happening, it's coming, so now it's time for the preparedness. Um, we've identified a number of different challenges and risks, and so now is the time to start working on developing a plan, implementing and training, and becoming a leader in your community. Um, I would say we're within, um, with this workshop even, we're in the two to three. We're gonna give you some information to help you with developing your plan. We're gonna provide a little bit of training, um, but then it will be up to you all in terms of the implementing and then becoming uh, champions in your community um, and leading them. Because it does take, um, in terms of shifting folks and shifting, folks like to see it. Folks wanna see somebody else doing it and then go, okay, I think I can do that. That's, that that's looks doable. Um, so it is helpful to have that last component of being being a leader in your community. Um, so the previous section, focusing on identifying that risk, um, let's you know, look a little bit more on the forestry side, what other risks are associated. We know it's gonna get warmer. So what does that mean? So for our lower elevation west side forests, these forests in general, when we think of the different resources that are out there, they're more moisture limited. And so with it being warmer, with them evaporating uh, or transpiring more, um, we'll see a decrease in growth for Douglas fir, Western Hemlock, Western Red Cedar, and Sitka Spruce. For our east side forests, again, even more moisture limited, we'll see a decrease in growth for Ponderosa Pine, Douglas Fir, and Western Larch. Whereas our high elevation forests, these are more energy limited because they're higher elevation, it's colder temperature, and so with an increase, warmer climate, they will actually um, are projected to experiencing an increase in growth because the temperatures are gonna be warmer for them. So increase in growth for subalpine fir, mountain hemlock, and um, lodgepole pine. For the riparian areas, these are generally water controlled. And so this becomes a little bit trickier since we're seeing that there can be a variety of extremes. Um, just throwing this out in terms of a general that we'll see just changes and growth and regeneration in these systems um, and potentially even fire susceptibility uh, because there will be the two extremes of too much water and then not enough water. So now putting, so developing a plan, it also helps to have some uh, context for this plan. Keeping in mind that, um, as Kurt mentioned, uh, you know, the previous management and mismanagement that's happened, uh, most of the lower elevation forests have been harvested at least once. So what's happened, what management decisions were made, that's going to influence what the current state is um, of that forest. Many of the forest landscapes are fragmented right now um, due to harvest, roads, agriculture, and urbanization. Uh, so depending on your goals, again, this current information, this context um, is important to have as well as then understanding how the climate and that climate lens will influence things. Likewise, there are some forests that have some significant non-native plant species, native insects, non-native insects, and pathogens that are affecting them. And so we still need to manage for these things, we still need to understand these things, and then adding on the climate context that it's going to get warmer. So if your forests are already dealing with a number of these challenges, um, it's not gonna get easier with a, with a warmer climate. So in terms of a developing a plan, <clears throat> what to consider when looking at different species. Here are some characteristics to try to include um, high seed production or propagule production, dispersal of seeds. If you're not doing the refor if you're um, not doing regeneration or reforestation yourself, do they disperse and have that natural vegetation propagation happening? Are these species tolerant to uh, low soil moisture, high air temperature, wildfire? Are they really competitive? Um, do they have just a general broad tolerance of the environment? So can they be more flexible um, to a variety of different environments? And then that genetic diversity. The reason we need the genetic diversity is that you then have individuals that have a uh, different genetics that, can, that are adapted to different environments um, and can then be uh, able to offer individuals for future env environment. When there is climate change adaptation, um, this is, what are we trying to do? We're trying to just reduce the negative effects of climate change um, and maintain our systems. We are also trying to transition 
to a warmer climate, um, whether that be within a species, different species, um, and within different ecosystems. Again, that temperature is gonna get warmer. So in terms of actions you'll be taking, as Kurt mentioned, many of these things um, they'll be talking about are not uh, totally new, something you've never heard about. It'll be doing many of the same actions. They're just gonna be more important to actually do them. I know there's a lot of forest landowners that push off and wait and um, don't get around to doing it. And I say that because it's my own neighbors and I see what they're doing and seeing that they haven't thinned recently or that their Christmas trees are taller than the house. And so I'm not sure what they're doing. Um, so you really need to um, have your current plan, but have that climate lens on there. You also want it, this is a component of sustainable resource management, as well as a form of risk management. Um, I laid out a number of different risks that are coming. Um, the probability of these events may change with climate change, with the increased risk of wildfire, and then um, on the bottom showing you the magnitude of loss and cost. And so as we're in this kind of safer zone, the probability of something happening and the loss or the cost of it isn't so bad, um, you're willing to accept that risk. I handle paper, I may get a paper cut. Okay, that's, that's a low risk. The probability of me getting a paper cut's low. It's not a big cost. But if it's something larger, you're gonna wanna take those mitigation actions and preventive, whether there's either a large cost or a high probability of that event. And if you have the two of them, that's where you wanna take actions that you're avoiding um, those risks when possible. So how do you manage for a resilient forest in a warmer climate? <clears throat> need to change some of the older concepts. Um, in the past, going with what the historic range variation would be, using that as a guide. Um, as I showed you, the temperatures have already changed, have been changing. And so using that historical is using uh, information that's based on a climate that does not exist right now here and today, and will not exist in the future, and is going to get warmer. And so using those, you're gonna be um, using information that's not relevant climate-wise to today. Uh, focusing on a single species um, for success, it was frequently done in, in the past, um, that will need to be changed, as well as focusing more on smaller scales. Moving forward, for newer concepts, is incorporating that climate change information into your management and planning actions. But it's also looking at the current as well as future range, right? The plants need to regenerate in order to make it there to the end. So they need to be adapted to that future climate, but they also need to rege um, regenerate now. Um, and looking at larger scales and looking at the whole ecosystem as you're developing these plans, working with your neighbors to develop these plans. Your forest, your land may be perfect, but if your neighbors are not, that's not reducing your risk. Regeneration is a critical stage. Um, who establishes in those warmer climates is gonna determine what your forest is. So you want to um, take care of those seedlings. I mean, these seedlings need to cope with a variation in temperature and soil moisture. Seedlings in general are, are hardier than their older selves, um, but there's gonna be a lot of challenges of even warmer temperatures. So some of the strategies you can take is um, anything that's gonna help retain that soil moisture in the summer, um, whether that be um, mulching, putting mulch pads down, or even protecting them from herbivory. Um, that will be helpful, just general things to help pamper those seedlings. And then again, looking at what the recent weather is and, and timing your planting. If, if, if you've been in a drought or the anticipation and as a drought is coming, if you have the opportunity to wait on planting until some, a wet period is projected, um, that may be better to increase your survival. I've heard from a lot of local, um, local landowners saying that they've had a lot of loss, higher than they've ever seen before. And I'm sure based on when they're planting, the droughts, recent droughts have not been helping. You want to be uh, more flexible with seed zones, and Brad's gonna be talking about this in a lot more depth. But just keep in mind these uh, seed zone maps, some of them were made in 1960s, some of them were made in 1990s. The climates for when these were developed do not exist right now and are not gonna exist in the future. 
So Brad's going to talk about the seed lot selection tool, which maps different climate variables that are important to tree species. And um, help and say, where should I be sourcing my material to plant here? Or if you are providing someone else, you know, if you're a nursery, what do I have and who should I be marketing to? Who should I be selling it to? Um, this tool will help you with that because you want the plants again to be adapted to here and now so that they can establish and start growing, but also have the ability to um, thrive in the future warmer climate. Assisted migration and managed relocation. Um, so my background is genetics, uh, plant ecology, and I find this means different things to different people. So with assisted migration, this could mean using a different seed zone. So your particular seed zone in your region where your forest is, you could be taking seed zones, um, neighboring seed zones, that would be your future climate. This could count as assisted migration. So this is something um, to consider. Uh, Brad will talk more about this, but again, in terms of are we ready for whole new species to be coming in, I don't know that uh, our current climates are there yet for, the, for, for Oregon. I can tell you parts of Alaska are thinking about it, but they've had changes of uh, this November, some parts of Alaska were 16 degrees warmer than average. When you are selecting your species, again, I bring up drought. Um, as that I think is going to be a big selecting factor. Find those that are more tolerant to drought. And so Oregon Forestry Department has a lovely website um, and has this table in which they list the different tree species, their drought tolerance, and some high risk scenarios. And so can you focus more on those that are medium to high drought tolerant um, and, and putting those species in rather than those that are more susceptible? Um, and then all the other scenarios, when you look at the scenarios, you see other management actions should be taken in terms of the, I, I bring up the Christmas tree farm because of my one neighbor. Um, it's overstocked, they're too tall. I worry about it as that being my neighbor. Um, they need to take some thinning to, to help those out or just replant um, based on what their priorities are. Again, bringing up the seed lot selection tool, planting those native species from the seed sources they're suited to um, and, and conditions at your local planting site. Um, again, this tool is going to help you with the climate information, but you'll also still need to bring in your expertise of what are the soils here, what are the conditions here, what aspect of a slope are you on, um, and then focusing on those. So again, focusing for those future climates and then considering that drought stress. In terms of maintenance, uh, increasing thinning or even increasing spacing between plantings. Um, this then allows there to be more water available for there being fewer trees. A nice analogy is thinking of too many straws in a cup of water. You know, we each get a sip that's not going to take us very far if there's fewer straws in that cup of water that gives us more water to get um, to survive. Along those lines, reducing competition for species, particularly non-native species that are present. Also not to fertilize, if that's part of your management, um, not to fertilize during a drought. That actually makes plants utilize more water and actually winds up stressing them out and not helping them. Um, so for prevention and control, monitoring will be really important and Christine will be chatting more on this aspect, um, but being aware of what pests and disease, diseases are in your area. Um, if you have a few weak trees that are severely stressed out, um, by insects or disease to remove those so that those they don't allow insect populations or pest populations to build up to the point that they can start impacting the healthy trees. For your understory, again back to the native plants, selecting more drought tolerant understory um, so that they actually will wind up serving a number of different ecosystem services but are really tolerant to drought um, and can help with giving you a more, um, helping you more on the ecosystem level. Praise of hardwoods, depending on where you are, can, to consider them, particularly in riparian areas, and that they do provide some wildlife habitat. Some of them do have high value for their wood products or firewood. Um, and that they can be resistant to some conifer diseases. If you have certain um, fun fungal diseases in the um, soils, you may want to consider switching over to hardwoods um, that are resistant to those diseases. Um, and also consider the benefits that can come from these, whether the red alder fixing nitrogen, um, and also you can get more diversity um, planting them others under some conifer species. Along those lines, increasing that structure, whether it's within the forest or between gaps, adding some closed areas, some open areas, um, considering that in your management. 
as well as considering um, the water needs of the various plants that you're putting in if you're going to change the densities of the planting as well as where they're located on the landscapes that you're managing. Keeping your forest healthy in terms of, again, that competition, too many straws and a cup of water, um, as well as then reducing the fuels that are available on the landscape. So thinning to reduce that competition, taking out those invasive plants, um, and then managing across the landscape, which again will require that management with neighbors. If your forest is perfect and your neighbors are not, your risk is still high. Um, so working with them when possible and finding those opportunities. Um, other suggestions, oop, that came up all fun. Um, other suggestions, in short, this is just to say there is no specific rule, but consider variable densities um, when you are doing your thinning and not to be consistent, to add that variability um, and allow for uh, different ecosystem functions there. Again, back to that reducing competition, getting rid of those stressors, those non-native species, and trying to be on top of that. And then um, just kind of summarizing here of, again, warmer temperatures, more extremes. Consider the diversifying your plant species, the different genotypes in particular, you know, bringing in different seed zones. So when I say genotypes, those could be different seed zones that you're bringing in. Um, and then diversifying the patterns that they're planted in the density. Um, Disturbance, so if you do have a fire or something of that nature, those could be opportunities to um, change the system that is, that is there and change the plants that are there, I should say. Um, and even experimenting of trying a few areas of some different species just to see how well they do. Um, again, that risk management, considering that, considering your risks are changing now um, and implementing that in your plans and then continuing to monitor and adjust as needed. So there's a lot of different information, and I know um, one thing that's helpful is tools. You may be more accustomed to the ones on the right, but getting to need to be more dependent on your computers and what information, particularly with climate change, what information they can provide. So some things to consider, we mentioned the drought and understanding what's happening. NOAA does put out these cl short-term um, climate change projections for six to 10 days, two weeks, and up to three months. Uh, do they just generally expect it to be warmer, about average, cooler, wetter, about average, or drier. And for temperature, that's shown your blues being colder, your reds being warmer, and then for precipitation, browns being drier and greens being wetter. You can look at these and get a sense of um, what, what the general projection is and then make decisions of if you're going out to, say, apply herbicides and a drought is projected, the plants may not take up those chemicals and they may not be as effective. And so you're not, your time isn't as uh, useful um, in that sense. There's also the climate toolbox. This is a collection of different tools that show information for agriculture, fire and water, um, a variety, variety of different variables. They show historical data, so you can kind of see what's happened in the past, and then look at future climate projections. Um, with this tool, um, they have, um, I like the climate mapper to show the temperature and precipitation changes. They also show if you, um, for those of you that need to develop reports and things of that nature, they have um, bar graphs and charts that you can include to help show um, what kind of information is there. Uh, the really nice thing about this tool is they give you a tour. Every single time they give you an option so they can walk you through and you can figure out how to use it. Uh, just to show you, this is the mean daily temperature the last 90 days. You're able to zoom in and click on a location or even put in a latitude and longitude um, and get an idea of what is it, what's the temperature been like on average for the last 90 days. You can get this for precipitation as well. They also have this for historical to understand what's happened in the past. Um, as well as what is projected for the two different emission scenarios. So they have the RCP 4.5 if we're able to reduce greenhouse emissions and 8.5 um, if we keep going as usual. And so in this figure, it's showing you the mean temperature change um, is looking for, uh, I think this is Stevenson, Washington, being eight degrees warmer in the winter. I mentioned the U.S. Drought Monitor. Again, they're weekly maps that are produced for the entire United States. Um, they have them specific for the Northwest Climate Hub region. You can see that if you're interested, as well as specifically for the state of Oregon. And you can even zoom in um, 
uh, well, you can zoom in on the state and then highlight your counties as well as you look at those. It doesn't get any more uh, closer than that than the state level. Uh, again, Brad will be chatting about this seedlot selection tool, looking at future climates and how, which, which areas are suitable for similar climates, um, where you should be sourcing your planting material. If you would like additional uh, information, background information, particularly if you're re producing reports and things of this nature, I would suggest going to Adaptation Partners. Um, they're working with a lot, working with a lot of the national forests um, in the Western United States, and they've worked on they've worked on all of them. And currently, the Sayusla is the last one in Oregon that's underway right now, um, and they've compiled a lot of the information um, in terms of forestry, streams, recreation, um, and a number of other topics and provide projections and adaptation strategies. Also within this resource, they have a library of different adaptation strategies. This is my specific concern. What are some things? This information comes from other land managers as well as scientists, and they work together to develop this information. So this could be a good resource of what other actions should I consider for the specific thing I'm interested in. Uh, this bark beetle forecast tool, um, again, just to get a sense of it, is this a concern considering the last few years of drought? Um, are the trees in my area more at risk of bark beetle or not? Just to give you an indication of, is this something I should be looking for, for or not? Should I be monitoring or not? Plugging my own organization, Northwest Climate Hub, we have a monthly newsletter. There, we've supported the seedlot selection tool as well as Climate Mapper and a num num number of other tools. I mentioned the Pacific Northwest Drought Early Warning System webinars that happen every other month. Um, the next one will be later this month. Um, that give you, it's a fun, it's a one hour webinar, four topics are discussed in, in an hour, looking at what's happened recently in the climate, looking at what happens in the future, and then two specialty speakers that can be anywhere on agriculture, forestry, rangelands of different tools, resources um, that you can take, undertake. And then um, we compiled uh, all the USDA resources that can, on a much broader scale, be used to help adapt to climate change. Um, we focus specifically on tribes, but actually um, out of the 150 programs that are there, only uh, 30 of them are only for tribes. Many of them are available to um, a variety of other nonprofit organizations and or individual landowners. So with that, I've given you a ton of information and you're about to hear more depth from the other speakers.